Now let's take a look at something called a polar. And there are two versions of this primarily. One is called a poll in and the other is called a poll out. Now for the poll in, the poll in checks for the socket's readiness to be read from and the poll out checks for the readiness of the socket to write to. So the poll in typically is meant for the receiving side of your application and the poll out is meant for the sending side of your application. Now, why is this important? The primary uh, thing is efficiency. Now, if you want asynchronicity in your applications uh, by having multiple sockets in a single thread, you can actually do that. You don't need the polar. You can uh, check for return conditions on each socket, and uh, depending on true or false, you can uh, go forward in your execution flow. Because typically, remember, the receiving methods are mostly blocking. So you have to be careful with um, how you handle the asynchronous behavior in those sockets if you are not using the polar. What ends up happening is that uh, one of two things. You either spend a lot of CPU cycles constantly checking for these return conditions and uh, proceeding with the uh, event loop uh, and your CPU just goes full throttle, or you end up putting some kind of a one millisecond or a two millisecond speed bump to sort of cool down that um, a CPU usage. But then that's not, um, that's not efficient either, right? So the one or two milliseconds for a CPU is an eternity. And it's actually not even one or two milliseconds. It's, a, it's actually probably much more, some, uh, you know, some non-deterministic amount, probably 10, 15, 20 milliseconds each time. So it's uh, not very uh, efficient to go about things that way. So that's why we need the polar. And specifically in, on the receiving side, the pole in. We have multiple sockets. The polar tells us, hey, socket one is ready to be read from. You read from socket one and go back to the polar. And the polar is what is the blocking call, not the individual sockets themselves. And with the polar, you can have infinite block. You can have zero, which is immediately times out and gives you a return condition. And you can have, you know, a specified user specified one or two or five milliseconds, whatever you want of a timeout. So it's very versatile. You can use it in many different ways. And, um, you know, also it helps if you have other things to do. Let's say uh, receiving is not the only thing you're doing. You, you're, taking a, you're taking care of other peripheral issues. Let's say every one second, so you can have a timeout on the polar itself. But we're going to look at that shortly. So on the sending side here, we have two push sockets with equal probability. We are going to send a message on one of them. We'll implement a small speed bump there. On the receiving side, we'll have two pull sockets on 555 five, five, and 5556. Five, five, and inside the event loop, by default, this will be blocking. Okay, I'll show you that the execution in this event loop is not going to proceed because one of the received sockets is going to be waiting on a message that never ends up arriving 
because the execution flow is blocked on the other socket. There, it's the receiving side is basically stuck at that point. Now the naive way of fixing that is to put in a receive flag, don't wait, and check for the return conditions. Now, if you don't check the return condition itself, it's simply going to be an infinite loop at this point. Okay. So the return condition here is a std optional. And you can check if it has a value or if it doesn't have a value. If it has a value, you can extract the message. So now your program on the receiving side is asynchronous, but there's a problem with this. If you look at the CPU usage for that program, it's going to be incredibly high because you're constantly in that event loop, you're checking. So my screen uh, recording software is probably around 25%, an additional 20% is being taken up by that uh, pull in underscore pull dot exe. And obviously that's uh, not a good sign. You cannot have realistic applications take that much CPU for basically nothing. A way of fixing this is a bit of a hack. You can put in a small speed bump, let's say a one millisecond speed bump But that one millisecond speed bump is not actually a one millisecond speed bump. It's, it's much larger than that. And it's a non-deterministic amount. So if you run it again, same result as before. But if you look at the CPU usage, it's um, it's much lower, and that CPU usage is just a screen recording software. Okay, so that's taking up next to no CPU power. But you've handicapped yourself in a different way. You've limited the amount of times you can go through uh, that event loop because you have a speed bump in there, right? It's a fixed speed bump that uh, limits the amount of times that you can receive a message in a limited amount of time. It's not truly asynchronous.